Hey, you've got the wrong person. I'm just a manager going back home from my annual vacation in Europe. The TSA agent pulls out a massive chunk of delicious French cheese from your hand luggage. Turns out, you can only grab really small amounts of soft cheese on board, since it's considered to be liquid. Fun fact, you can bring a cheese grater on board without any problems, but you can grate no more than 3.4 ounces. That's the maximum cheese amount. Wait, you can't grate it. Cheese should be safely sealed in a plastic bag. Good news, hard cheese is fine to travel with. Okay, they took your cheese. A large bottle of water, you're bad. Some cream tubes and other fancy souvenirs. Look at that fine Swiss knife you grabbed in Geneva. It now risks ending up in an auction. If you're lucky enough, the airport might provide a shipping service to get your precious souvenirs and even cheese, if it doesn't go bad, to your home for a fee. Still, not all the airports do this. So, some of the banned items will go to an auction to raise money. The confiscated items are usually sold in bulks, so it's going to be pretty hard to find the ones that you had to leave behind. Some other objects with more specific purposes are donated to different organizations. A uh, pepper spray, for instance, would go to a police training academy. As for cheese, prohibited exotic fruits, and other food and water, well, they usually just get disposed of. Some items, especially really bad and dangerous ones, may be simply melted or destroyed. Magic 8 balls pose no danger, but they have to be checked in luggage. The problem is the liquid inside them. Yeah, it might be less than 3.4 ounces, but let's face it, it's hard to count the exact amount. Ask your ball if you can take it on board. It's likely to give you a don't count on it answer. Relieving gel insoles are a bit disturbing on board. The problem is the same. It's impossible to count the exact amount of liquid. So no gel insoles and no gel candles either. Perfume and nail polish are kind of forbidden too. It's not only about liquid on board restrictions, but also about etiquette rules. Some passengers may simply be allergic to their smell. Plus, they're flammable. As for nail polish removers, opt for an acetone-free version, since acetone is a no-go for hand luggage. Anyway, you can grab a bottle of perfume as long as it's not too large and you don't use it on board. It would be a pity to leave a whole bottle in the trash bin before boarding. Still, you can sneak in the plane with more than 3.4 ounces of your favorite cream, claiming it's some medicine that you really need. But you do need to notify the airport beforehand. A bit weird, but it works. Sometimes. In case you need to check your body temperature on board, make sure your thermometer is electronic. Mercury ones are strictly forbidden. Who's going to pick up all the mercury balls if you accidentally drop it? Bowling pins are a no-go for hand luggage. Seems like the air crew doesn't want anyone to have fun and play bowling in the aisles during a long and boring flight. No, it's all about our safety. They just think bowling pins might hurt someone. No sports equipment is allowed, be it a fencing foil, a bat, or even darts. Darts are sharp, and no sharp objects are allowed on board. Such items should travel in check-in luggage, unless you want them to end up in an auction. If you're into handmade things, and a transatlantic flight gives you enough time to knit a scarf or a pair of socks, Opt for plastic or wooden knitting needles and wrap them carefully so as not to cause any damage. Those made of metal will probably be disposed of by melting, and they don't deserve such a fate. Snow globes, as with any other object containing liquid inside, aren't allowed through security. If your snow globe is as small as a tennis ball, you may be lucky to have it allowed, but it's better to play it safe and check the snow globe in. Liquid bleach is definitely a weird object for hand luggage, even if you're traveling in a white shirt. First, it's not allowed on board because it's highly flammable. Second, a brand new white shirt doesn't seem to be the right choice for a flight. <laughs> Coffee and turbulence just don't mix. Third, the bathroom on board is far too small for laundering. If you're a hairdresser on a business trip, you'll probably have to invest a bit more when booking your flight. No hair bleach is allowed on board. Scissors aren't welcome either, unless their blades are four inches or shorter. By the way, scissors that aren't allowed to fly are often donated to schools, which is a good alternative to disposing them. Bad news for hairdressers again. Due to a gas cartridge that's filled with butane, cordless curling irons aren't allowed on board. Good news, electric curling irons are completely fine and safe. If you're an artist, you must have already struggled with security rules. You don't want your paint to get frozen or ruined in the luggage section, so you'll surely want to bring it on board. Security may be okay with your oil paints, as long as they're under 3.4 ounces, but there's no way you can grab your extremely flammable turpentine. Now, in case you don't enjoy food on a plane and failed to order a meal on board beforehand, 
You can take any pan or pot on board and cook it yourself. No, you can't cook. And you can't grab a cast iron pan either. They're quite heavy. That's why they're likely to be dangerous. If a TSA agent confiscates it, it won't end up being donated to a local kitchen. It'll probably be melted. If you want to have some fresh smoothies while flying with fresh fruit that are allowed on board, like an apple or a banana, bad news for you. Blenders are allowed only in case you remove the blades. So technically, it's not a blender anymore. Hey, here's when you need that cheese grater. English Christmas crackers can make a wonderful atmosphere of joy and happiness during Christmas holidays, but it brings nothing but a mess on board. It makes a cracking sound when pulled, which can frighten other passengers. They are not allowed in checked bags, just like party poppers and sparklers. High heels and thick soles aren't prohibited, but they do cause some problems. If you're wearing one of these, you may be asked to take them off to have them scanned. Sure, there are some plastic shoe covers, but ugh, these airport floors are swarming with germs. Wedding dresses are a bit of a problem too. Some dresses just don't fit in the x-ray machine, so they might need to be double-checked. All the fans of camping, beware. You probably want to check in a lot of luggage required for your trip, so make sure you check in the tent pegs too. Though, if you travel light with a carry-on backpack only, you'll probably need to buy some when you reach your destination. Since they're sharp objects, tent pegs are not allowed on board. It's hard to imagine anyone having a drill inside their five-pound carry-on luggage. But anyways, these are not allowed. So if you're a creative person who wants to bring a drill home as a vacation souvenir because magnets are lame, you'll have to check it in. If you want to sneak in a plane with a dry ice DIY fridge, you're almost sure to fail. It's flammable, so safety regulations definitely prohibit it on board. You can bring up to 5.5 pounds of dry ice, but airline permission is required. Anything with an uncovered blade is not allowed through security. Instead, a disposable razor or cartridge blades can be taken on board. Box cutters and knives, with a teeny tiny exception of a smooth butter knife, should be in checked luggage. Soap bars are allowed on board, but don't panic if a TSA agent wants to double check your bag after scanning it. It just may look a bit odd on the screen and mislead them. Liquid soap, instead, follows the universal liquid rule. Rules for batteries may vary. Spillable batteries are allowed neither in carry-on nor in checked luggage. And lithium batteries also can't be carried on board, only because if damaged, they can cause a fire. Okay, you travel with your Mr. Scratchy. And yes, a laser pointer is your furry friend's favorite toy. But you gotta make do without it this time, buddy. Laser pointers are not allowed in carry-on nor in checked luggage. A walking stick can be used as a mobility device and then let on board. But surprisingly, TSA may prohibit this item sometimes. Play it safe and notify your airline in advance. Bon voyage! The national Jamaican fruit, Aki, has a truly unique taste. It's mild and buttery, and people who tried it say it tastes just like scrambled eggs. It's safe to eat Aki only as long as it's fully ripe. So the import of raw Aki's was banned in the U.S. almost 50 years ago. The only edible part is the white, creamy flesh itself. The pink flesh looks mouthwatering, but don't fall for it. It's highly toxic. Same with the black seeds. Soursop is one more fruit banned from the U.S. because of its toxins. It's also referred to as guanabana and can release toxic substances, leading to some very unpleasant effects if not ripe. Soursop fans, don't be sad. Chances are, you might find some frozen pulp in supermarkets. Another thing that should be 100% ripe to be safe is elderberry. Raw elderberry is rich in vitamin C, which is good for you, and cyanide, which is not that good. These berries are quite popular, though. You can find them in pies, syrups, teas, jams, you name it. Fully ripe and cooked berries aren't dangerous. And nope, it's not banned. Cyanide doesn't seem that serious when it comes to food with tetrodotoxin, which is 1,200 times stronger. Pufferfish is a Japanese delicacy, and it's loaded with the substance. No person can eat this fish without consequences, but Japanese chefs have mastered their skills to perfection. To make it edible, they simply remove the poisonous parts. This delicacy is called fugu and costs about $200 per portion. You could buy a whole bunch of totally safe salmon instead. It's almost completely banned in the US. There are only a few authorized places that sell it, 
but you probably don't feel like having such a gastronomic adventure either way. Kasu marzu literally means rotten cheese. Sorry, you can't try a bite of it in the US, so in case you can't resist the temptation, just head to the island of Sardinia, Italy. In fact, it's just sheep milk cheese with a pinch of, mm, let's say, magic. Special flies leave their eggs right inside that cheese, and they stay there for 40 days. At the moment it's ready for consumption, this cheesy delicacy has some live maggots taking care of decomposing it. Thanks to them, the cheese has that distinctive texture and spicy flavor. It's banned in the US for sanitary reasons. Unlike soft and creamy Kasu Marzu, the Himalayan cheese Chirpy is famous for being the world's hardest. Just like any regular product of this type, it's made from milk. What makes it different is that it stays fresh for up to 20 years. The milk is quite special too. The cows, which are actually a cross between cows and yaks, eat a variety of mountain herbs. This milk has a unique flavor thanks to those herbs, but be careful with your teeth nibbling on that hardest stone cheese. In Singapore, you'll never have cavities because of chewing gum. And nope, it's not because they take care of your teeth. The thing is, it's completely illegal there. This place is known for its cleanliness, and the country spent a fortune cleaning all the spots and banning chewing gum. It was prohibited back in 1992, and vendors had to stop the sales immediately to avoid super high fines. Walking down the supermarket aisles while traveling to different destinations, you may spot that there's no raw milk in stock. It's prohibited in many US states and other countries, including Canada, Norway, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and Scotland, for sanitary reasons. While raw milk is a no-go for Scotland, haggis is completely fine there. Still, it's banned in the US. If you live in the States and you're under 45, chances are you've never tried haggis, since it was prohibited almost half a century ago. This Scottish pudding is made of a full range of sheep's inner parts, mixed with some oatmeal and spiced up with a bunch of minced onions. Oh, and don't forget suet and some broth. The texture is crumbly and coarse, and no surprise, the dish is quite spicy. It's usually served with mashed potatoes or mashed turnip. Cassava is a poisonous tropical root with two types. The sweet variation does contain some cyanide, but it's enough to cook it to reduce the toxic content to a non-toxic level. To get rid of all the toxins in bitter cassava, it's necessary to grate the root, then soak it, and finally cook properly to make it edible. This root is very starchy, and its flavor is really subtle. Cassava can be used just like potatoes, mashed, boiled, or fried. What do you think? How about some haggis with mashed cassava instead of potatoes on the side? By the way, harmless potatoes aren't that safe either. It all depends on whether it's ripe or not. So-called green potatoes are full of toxins, and potato sprouts are also quite unsafe. Same with green almonds and cashews, which are full of cyanide if not ripe enough. Luckily, the nuts we get at the supermarket are well processed, which means they're completely safe. Yellow plums, or Mirabelle plums, are banned in all the 50 states of America. These fruits are completely fine, and nothing bad happens if you eat them. But you can only enjoy these plums in Lorraine, France. The importation law is a bit bizarre, and this fruit is of protected origin. If sea bass is the kind of dish you just can't live without, then the UK isn't your destination. This fish has been recently banned there because of declines in the sea bass population. The same goes with beluga caviar in the US. One of the world's most expensive foods can't be found in America because of new regulations protecting the fish. Hey, feel like a burger with freshly cooked meat, the softest bun, and loads of ketchup? Go and grab it, unless you're a French school student. There's a law in France regulating the use of ketchup in cafeterias for students and they're only allowed to have it with, you guessed it, french fries. Greenland shark bodies get rid of all the waste they produce, filtering it through their flesh and skin, so no wonder their flesh is toxic. Sounds like a fair reason not to eat them, but not in Iceland. Hakarl, which is processed shark meat, is first hung to dry for three to five months. In the end, 
you get something like ammonia-smelling fermented fish with the jelly texture that reminds you of wet bread. Some things get better with age, unless it's food. But there's one cafe in Bangkok where they've been cooking the same beef and noodle soup for 45 years. This potion-like soup has been simmering for over four decades. The broth has never been thrown away, and it's always kept overnight for the next day's servings. One of the secrets of the unique flavor is the massive grease rim around the pan that formed because they never washed it. Okay, now I've got the perfect excuse to do the same thing. What? The food just tastes better this way. In Cambodia, you can try a crunchy, crispy snack that tastes somewhat like a crab. It's deep fried and a bit seasoned. The main ingredient is a tarantula. Uh, this doesn't quite sound like a lunch. Okay, well, you wouldn't have guessed it if I hadn't told you. This soup that sounds like a tongue twister is definitely scrumptious. The flavor is sharp, yet delicate, and it tastes just like shrimp. Well, this traditional Laotian dish sounds really cool, until you realize it's made of ant eggs. To give it a bit of sourness, they also tend to add a few tiny ants. In Mexico, you don't throw away corn kernels that have turned black because they're rotten. You keep them as a culinary specialty called huitlacoche. Fungus all over the kernel give that earthy, woody smell. Yum, yum. Some dishes just need decoration, especially cakes and pies. In England, there's a pie called stargazy. The name speaks for itself. The sardines, accompanied by potatoes and eggs, peek out of the pie's crust and stare at the skies. And it looks a bit creepy. Sometimes it's the tails that point at the skies, though. Tea mushroom is another weird thing that they drink in Eastern Europe, together with acid milk-based drinks. It's basically some fermented black or green tea. It's made by adding a whole culture of bacteria. They're not consumed, they just ferment the drink. To sweeten tea, the sugar acts like yeast. Add juice, spice, or whatever you want to taste. Enjoy, or at least try to. Tuna eyeballs are quite a popular delicacy in China and Japan. They need to be boiled before eating, and some seasoning is required too. If you nail it, you'll have a delicacy that tastes like squid. And it costs less than a dollar. <laughs> I bet you're eyeing that one. 300,000 people and over 80,000 horses. Yep, that's Iceland. The breed they have there is very specific, hardy, long-lived, and because of it, internationally popular. These horses can be found in North America and Europe too, but they can have certain features people from Iceland don't want their breed to have. Because of that, the Icelanders wanted to avoid mixing their horses with other breeds. So they passed a law over 1,000 years ago that said no horse imports. That's right, even if they give you some of their own horses, you can't take them back. No chewing gum in Singapore. Vandals used to stick their chewing gum on door sensors or would find some other way to mess with public transportation. So the country had to spend around $150,000 annually to clean that. It was easier to ban it by law. So no gum can be bought, sold, or blown into bubbles over there. Um, not a good idea to import them either. Going to Greece? Good. Have a safe trip. And pick the right shoes. Ever since 2009, no high heels are allowed at the Acropolis. Not that Greeks have anything against stilettos, but they simply wanted to protect their ancient ruins from damage those pointy things can cause. That and the fact that it's not really practical for such terrain anyway. In the Italian city of Milan, it's illegal to frown in public. Or at least it was a couple of centuries ago. Through difficult historical times, Milan had to create a way to stand out, which is why there was a law requiring people to smile and generally be in a good mood in public places. Germany has highways where you can drive over 100 miles per hour. But if you get crazy with speed and run out of gas while still on a highway, you'll pay a nice fine for that. Are you one to two miles away from the gas station and want to get there on foot? Uh, better not. That's another fine. Germans make it your responsibility for filling your car. And walking along the highway is not that safe, as is leaving your car on the side of the road. A Winnie the Pooh t-shirt. Ah, 
That brings back some good old memories. Well, memories are sometimes better left at home. Since Winnie doesn't wear pants, Poland decided to ban this character, so you can't have it on your clothes, around schools or playgrounds, no matter what age you are. Just in case you ever wake up and decide it's time to do some hiking in Switzerland without your clothes on, don't. For some unknown reason, some travelers made this type of hiking a thing in Switzerland a couple of years ago. So Swiss officials kindly ask you to keep your clothes on. Greetings from New Zealand. If you want to spend your Sunday afternoon flying with a rooster in a hot air balloon, you might have to find another country to do it, because here it's illegal. Sorry. Staying in their neighborhood, in 1966, there was a law that prevented you from flying a kite in Australia in a public space if that bothered other people. Luckily, 1966 was a long time ago, so no one will remember this if you decide to have some flying kite fun in a park. Hopefully. While you're there, you can't tie your goat to your vehicle. Also, no dressing as Batman and Robin. You don't want to prove to law enforcement you're not actual vigilantes, right? In some cities, taxi drivers must have a bale of hay in their trunks at all times. At least, they had to until 1980. This law came from the olden days, when horses were still all the rage. And you can't just fill a horse with fuel now, can you? Moving to the United States now. If you're in Washington, don't even think about going after Bigfoot. They passed a law in 1969 where Bigfoot was proclaimed to be an endangered species. So, hmm, they didn't say anything about the Yeti, though. In Vermont, there used to be a rule prohibiting clotheslines, as some people voted against unsightliness of others' linen and underwear hanging in everyone's view. That's why they made a new regulation. You can't forbid people to put up clotheslines. One rule against another. Yep, that should work. Shh, can you hear that? Someone's talking behind this door. Oh, I wonder what they're saying. Stop right there. At least if you're in Oklahoma. The law says you can't secretly wander around and accidentally overhear someone's conversation and then repeat or publish it later. So if you have anything to share, go tell it to the people of Oklahoma. Your secret is safe there. If you ever take a walk in Nevada and then uh, decide to lay down on the sidewalk and take some rest, think twice since that's illegal there. Don't sit either. You won't get away with it. Nuances, you know. If you're from Baltimore, Maryland, remember not to bring your lion to the movies. I know the big cat wanted to see it badly, but rules are rules. Also, while you're there, remember a couple of more things you shouldn't violate. No saying bad words in public places. No eating while swimming in the ocean. And no sleeveless shirts in public parks. You shouldn't throw bricks onto a highway in Iowa. Unless you get written permission from the city council. Well, when you think about it, it's fair enough. If you don't feel like looking at large shiny billboards all over the city, go to Hawaii, since they banned those in 1920. Well, definitely not the only reason to visit Hawaii, but it's good to know. Meanwhile, other states like Vermont and Maine followed suit and are proud of it. One town in Georgia takes eating fried chicken very seriously. No fork, you eat it with your hands. In fact, in 2009, a woman who celebrated her 91st birthday in a restaurant was eating chicken with a fork when the police came and told her she was under arrest. The lady was later pardoned, but careful how you eat your chicken in Georgia. <laughs> what else is there to say? Speaking of which, do you know why the chicken crossed the road? <laughs> Not sure, but what I do know is that these jokes certainly weren't made up in Georgia, since there, it's illegal for a chicken to do just that. You think silly string is fun? Well, a town in Alabama doesn't agree on that because it says a firm no to keeping, using, storing, selling, manufacturing, or giving away any kind of snap pops, spray string, or similar substances. <laughs> Yikes. Also, when you're there, don't drive blindfolded. It's been passed as a law, which means they take the phrase, keep your eyes on the road, quite seriously. Okay, enough is enough. No more sleeping in a bathtub, donkey. Something people in Arizona must say to avoid breaking a law. 
In the 1920s, local people could see a rancher's donkey in a bathtub carried by a flood. The flood was caused because a local dam broke and the tub was abandoned in the rancher's backyard. The donkey simply decided to take a nap in it. And you know how it goes. Long day, warm afternoon, post-lunch rest, just couldn't help it. After they managed to save the animal from the sailing tub, the town decided to prohibit donkeys from sleeping in a tub. You know, just in case. In Connecticut, a pickle must bounce in order for it to be considered a pickle. In the 1940s, two men were even arrested for selling pickles that weren't legitimate because they didn't bounce. Now, the question is, how exactly does a pickle bounce? More from the Meanwhile in Connecticut episode. It's illegal to cross a street while walking on your hands. Oh man, that's one of the hardest ones not to break. Your best friend is having a birthday. What could you give her? Hmm, a spa day voucher? Tickets to Disneyland? Dinner at a fancy restaurant? A rat? Well, unfortunately, a rat is out of the legal game if you're in Montana. Well, you've got to respect the law. Luckily, if you're from Florida, rats are a completely fine gift. At least, way better than some bigger animals. Because while you're there, you need to pay parking fees for them. Camels, elephants, horses, and the rest of the animal crew. Sorry, guys. you got to respect the rules. So you invite your friend over for a cup of tea. To speed things up, you decide to skip the five-minute steeping time and squeeze the tea bag against the spoon. Your guest jumps off the couch and knocks the spoon off your hands. Turns out when you squeeze a tea bag or tea leaves, you release too many tannins into your drink. Tannins are a class of molecules that are found in many fruits and vegetables, like pomegranates, berries, nuts, legumes, cloves, or vanilla. When you do things the proper way and wait, most of the tannins stay with the plant material. When you squeeze, it causes the same results as oversteeping your tea. It becomes too bitter and can stain your teeth. Besides, draining a tea bag against the cup is a form of poor tea etiquette, just like slurping. Gee, now they tell me. The best you can do is wait for your tea to brew and then leave that bag on a saucer or throw it in the trash can. Don't peel bananas from the stem down. Mm -mm. Do it like the monkeys and go from the bottom up. Squeeze the tip of the fruit with your thumb and index finger. It'll split the skin without mashing the banana, and you won't lose even a bit of that potassium-filled fruit. Don't brush your teeth with horizontal movements only. Hold your toothbrush at a 45-degree angle to the gums and go in short strokes back and forth. Tilt the brush vertically and go up and down to clean the inside surfaces of the front teeth. To avoid splashing things around, put a paper plate on your mixer's beaters. It'll be a great temporary cover. When you're cutting a loaf of crusty bread, turn it over and go from the bottom. It'll be easier to slice on the soft side and you won't squish the bread. The right way to hold a pizza isn't flatly like you're used to, but in a U-shape to prevent it from flopping over. Pinch the crust a bit when you pick it up and all the toppings will stay inside. Don't pour your juice from the box with the opening on the top. Flip it over. When you do it from the top, you'll be able to control the flow and stop it neatly and quickly. You don't have to run around the vehicle looking for the gas tank every time you arrive at the gas station. There should be an arrow on the gas gauge to let you know which side to refuel your car. If you can't squeeze the juice out of a lemon, drop it in the microwave for about 10 seconds. Take it out, let it cool, slice it in half, Now, you can get most of it even with your bare hands. The lemon becomes much softer this way. Instead of putting the hair clip wavy side down, flip it over. When you place it wavy side down, it gets a better grip on your hair. You don't have to take aluminum foil out of the package to get a piece of it. Most boxes have a perforated tab on either side. Punch it and take as much foil as you need with the roll inside the box. Don't pour your Chinese takeout out of the paper container. Unfold it carefully, and it will turn into a little plate you can eat out of. Instead of just scrubbing pots and pans, boil some water inside and add a small amount of vinegar. Remove it from the heat and drain the vinegar down the sink. The gunk will come off easily. Rub half a lemon around the bottom and sides of your cookware for extra shine. Sprinkle the board with lemon juice, and you won't have to cry when cutting onions. You can also try dropping them in the freezer for 15 minutes or slice them underwater. 
This way the sulfuric compounds that make you tear up won't reach your eyes. Never defrost meat at room temperature or under hot water. In these conditions, the bacteria that were in there before multiply. Yeah, they learned that in school. The safest way is to plan your cooking ahead and put the meat in its packaging in a pan in the fridge. If you can't wait that long, plug up the sink and put your frozen food in cold water from the tap. Heat is transferred faster through water than air. When trying to correct a silly mistake or hide something after you've changed your mind, don't just scribble lines over your handwriting. It'll still be perfectly readable. Write some random letters on top of what you're trying to hide. Now no one will be able to read it. Don't spread your food over the plate evenly when microwaving it. The center takes longer to warm up, and the edges might get burnt. Leave an empty round space in the middle, and the entire meal will be perfectly warm at the same time. Instead of trying to pull the bit of the knot passing through the main knot, tap it with a spoon or a hammer, then twist the loose end. When you loosen it, push it through the knot. It should untie easily. To peel garlic quickly, hit the whole head with your palm against the top of the bulb. When you separate the cloves, put them in a bowl and cover it with a lid or another bowl. Shake it well for 15 seconds. The cloves will slam against the sides of the container and each other and get separated from their skins. Stop dipping your hand into a bag of popcorn, especially if you're sharing it with others. Rip the bag on the side and voila! You can pick it gracefully. If you have standard in-ear headphones, don't wear them straight down with a cable hanging on the front. Instead, loop them over the ear, and they won't fall out so easily. Don't try to clean a blender by scrubbing it. Fill it with water and add some dishwashing liquid, then blend it. Holding the steering wheel at 12 o'clock or 10 and 2, like you've probably been taught, won't give you the best control over your car. The right way to do it is to position your hands at 9 and 3. This way, the airbags will be able to fully inflate in case of an accident. Stop using cotton swabs to clean your ears. They can damage your hearing. In fact, you need some wax in there to waterproof the ear canal. You can clean around the outside of the ear with cotton swabs, but that's it. Don't buy unripe avocados and put them in the fridge waiting for them to get ready. Fresh-picked avocados need room temperature to ripen within 3-6 to days. Instead of putting chocolate in the fridge, store it in a cool, dry place. The temperature and humidity of the fridge make chocolate flavors dull. Plus, it can absorb odors from the fridge or get a white coating. If you keep it in the pantry, it'll stay stable for months, if it lasts that long. Certainly not around me. If you've broken enough nails adding new keys to the keyring, try doing it another way. Staple removers have teeth that are thin enough to slide between the rings. Use one of those to spread the key ring apart and add as many keys as you need safely. To cool down a beverage in less than 15 minutes, wrap a damp paper towel around the bottle before you drop it in the freezer. The water from the towel will quickly evaporate and cool. It'll help the surface of the bottle chill faster than the air in the freezer would do alone. To defrost ground beef faster, flatten it, place it in a separate plastic bag, and seal tightly. You can also drop it all in one bag and then take a long chopstick, ruler, or anything with a straight edge to divide it into sections. When ready to thaw, you can break off a section and place it in cold water. It'll be good for cooking in less than half an hour. The right way to use a toilet seat cover is to put the side with the flap towards the front. This way it'll fit better and prevent particles and germs from collecting there. Don't keep matching bedding separately. Fold your fitted sheet flat sheet and pillowcase in a rectangle and tuck the bundle inside a matching pillowcase. It'll save you a bunch of time you'd spend putting together a set. Plus, it makes your closet more organized. To prevent sticky notes from curling where the adhesive is, don't tear them bottom to top. Go from one side of the pad and pull the note to the other. When you're heating up pasta, rice, or vegetables, cover the dish with a damp paper towel. Since you normally cook them in water, these meals need some moisture to taste good after reheating. You can also put a glass of water in the microwave with pizza. It'll keep the crust fresh and crispy. So, it's pouring outside when you get on a plane. If you were in a car, you'd simply switch on the windshield wipers and the headlights after turning the key in the ignition. Do pilots do that? Airplanes spark so many questions, and it's time for some answers. Do planes have windshield wipers? 
Yes, commercial planes do, but they're only used during taxiing, takeoff, and landing. Once a plane reaches its cruising altitude, pilots turn them off. The plane's speed is fast enough to clear the windshields from rain. Wipers might be absent on single-engine airplanes because the propeller airstream blows strong enough to keep the water away. What happens when a plane loses one engine in flight? Actually, it goes, hey, has anybody seen my engine? It was just here a second ago. No, nothing special. The plane actually just keeps flying. There are certificates for planes flying over oceans or long distances that state how long they can do it. For example, the Boeing 787 can fly for more than 5 hours without the second engine. It's enough for pilots to plan a safe landing. Well, why is it so cold on a plane? The temperature on board averages 74 degrees Fahrenheit, about the same as in most office buildings. But you feel so cold because your body doesn't move much, producing less heat to warm itself. The crew doesn't turn the heat up because hot air can cause some passengers to faint during the flight. Do airplanes have horns? Yeah, and some of them have a whole trumpet section. Actually, yes, they do have horns, but pilots don't use it to scare away birds or get other aircraft's attention in the sky. Hey, move over, buddy! Actually, you can hear that high-pitched chime only on the ground when the plane isn't moving. Like when an engineer checks something in the cockpit and wants to get the attention of a ground crew member. Why do planes leave white trails in the sky? It happens when the engine burns fuel. It ejects water and carbon dioxide that gets mixed with the atmosphere. And since the air is cold at high altitude and this exhaust is hot, the water condenses and may freeze, creating those white tails. Do airplanes have brakes? Yes, there are multiple disc brakes made of carbon steel material, similar to the ones in your car. But using them only isn't enough to stop the plane when it touches the ground. The braking system also includes different surfaces that slide out of the wings and disrupt the airflow. Can a plane door open mid-flight? The cabin pressure is the force that won't let that happen. If someone tried to do it, they would have to overcome more than 24,000 pounds of pressure the weight of a ship anchor. Plus, there are lock bolts deep inside the aircraft structure that hold the door in place. What happens when lightning hits a plane? Now, statistics say this happens to every commercial plane about once a year. But the aircraft's metal parts and lightning protection systems prevent electrical buildup. So, in most cases, this leaves a plane with only a scorch mark on its surface. Why don't the seats and windows always line up? Good question! All commercial planes are designed with seats and windows perfectly aligned. But when an airline buys a jet, it often chooses to add extra seats. More seats mean more passengers and more tickets sold. And less of a view and less legroom for you. See how that works? Why do flight attendants touch the overhead compartment? You'd think that they're checking to see if it's closed tightly. But nope. They use a scalloped handrail hidden at the bottom of the overhead compartment for a steadier walk along the aisle. What are those white spiral marks on engines for? Well, since the ground staff wear hearing protection, they can't rely on their ears to decide if it's safe to approach the plane. Seeing that moving swirl on jet engines prompts them to stay away from the area. Why are there holes in airplane windows? Those windows actually have three panes of plexiglass. The tiny hole is in the middle one. It helps regulate the huge pressure difference inside and outside the cabin, so the outer pane can handle the load. If the outer pane happened to break, the middle one, even with a hole in it, would still be enough to keep the window intact. That hole also keeps the windows from fogging up. Why are there hooks on the wings? If there is an emergency landing on water, Passengers have to step on the slippery wings to use some emergency exits. That's why crew members secure one end of a rope to the door frame and the other to the wing through the hook. Another rope is secured in the second hole, safely leading passengers along the wing to the inflatable slide. Why do the wings have different colored lights? It's for Christmas. Now, that red light on the left wing tip The green one on the right and the white one on the tail make up the plane's navigational lights. They let other pilots know the plane's position and the direction it's moving in, 
toward them or away. Do planes have ignition keys? Well, since ignition keys are usually a security measure, most commercial planes don't need them. They're locked in hangars under 24-7 surveillance. To start the engine, a pilot just pushes buttons and turns switches. But smaller private planes, like a Cessna, have ignition keys to start the engine and even locks on the doors. Why are there triangles above the windows? These black and sometimes red stickers let the crew know which window is best to look out when they want to check the moving parts of the wing. If you get motion sickness during the flight, try to choose a seat between the triangles for a more comfortable trip. How can you get extra space on a plane? Well, if you're lucky enough to get an aisle seat, there's a magic button near the hinge under the armrest closest to the aisle. Press it, and the armrest will swing up to the back of your seat. Why are most planes white? Well, this color reflects the sun better than any other, so it helps keep a plane cool. It's also much easier to spot any cracks, dents, leaks, and other faults on the white surface. And paint makes a plane 1,200 pounds heavier, causing it to burn more fuel. Airlines save money by not painting them. Why don't airplanes have parachutes for passengers? Well, like paint, parachutes would also add extra weight, around 8,000 pounds. Plus, skydivers must go through at least 4 hours of training to learn how to handle a parachute. Lastly, jumping out of a plane at 35,000 feet in the air is simply not safe, because temperatures at that altitude are colder than the Arctic, minus 65 degrees. Why can't planes fly when it's hot? Well, the molecules in hot air are much more spread out. To lift a plane, you need dense air. That's why it gets harder for a plane to take off as the temperature increases. Besides, scorching weather can overheat the internal machinery or even melt some of its parts. So, if it gets 104 degrees Fahrenheit outside, your flight might be delayed. Why do planes have round windows? The very first commercial planes had square ones. But after some time, they started flying at a higher altitude that demanded the cabin be pressurized. Frequent pressurization and depressurization deformed and even broke windows with corners. They were replaced with round ones, since they withstand the pressure much better. How do the oxygen masks work? Very well, actually. If the cabin is depressurized at cruising altitude, it loses oxygen. The masks provide that, but only for 15 minutes. It's okay, though. That's long enough for the pilot to descend lower than 10,000 feet, where the air has more oxygen and people can breathe normally. What causes turbulence? Your trip gets bumpy because of three main reasons – storms, mountains, and jet streams. Just like an ocean, air creates waves when it meets a mountain. And sometimes it has nowhere to go but up in strong currents affecting a plane. Jet streams are bands of swift winds that appear when warm air masses collide with cold ones. Storm clouds push air away, creating unpredictable waves. Why do planes sometimes dump fuel? If there's an emergency landing, pilots must quickly get rid of excess weight, since they didn't burn it, and get to the destination runway as light as they should be. The lighter the plane, the softer it'll touch the ground, so no blown tires or fire. Why are the doors on the left side? Well, the captain usually sits on that side, so aligning the plane with the terminal jet bridge is easier. They fuel the aircraft and load baggage on the right side. If passengers are coming in on the left, it doesn't disturb those crews. Why do they dim the lights during takeoff and landing? It takes your eyes up to 30 minutes to fully adjust to a dark setting. Dimming the lights at night or dusk prepares them in case passengers need to make an emergency exit. They fade the lights during the day to save some engine power. Why are most plane seats blue? This color is psychologically associated with safety and reliability, so flight-weary passengers feel less anxious. Besides, stains and dirt are less visible on blue seats. Now we know! Alright, let's dish about condiments. In French schools, they're keeping a tight leash on ketchup, mayo, and vinaigrette. 
Why? Well, they're trying to up their meal game for the students. The rule is simple. These sassy sauces can't be just hanging out randomly. No, they must be served up with the most appropriate dish. It's all about making sure those kiddos are getting the best meal possible. Bon appetit! Did you know that chewing gum is a big no-no in Singapore? Yep, it's illegal to bring in any old gum. But you can get your hands on some special medical gum if you really need it. And let me tell you, Singapore doesn't mess around when it comes to gum. You could end up with a hefty fine or even spend some time behind bars. Maybe they'll really chew you out. (laughs) So just leave the double bubble at home if you're planning a trip over there. Now in Victoria, Australia, you've got to keep it down during certain times. Yep, you heard me right. No loud noises are allowed at night when everyone's trying to catch some Z's. And on Good Friday, try to keep it quiet all day long. So let's be considerate and give our ears a break, shall we? Now in Rome, you can't keep your goldfish in a boring old glass bowl. No siree, that's considered cruel because those little guys need their oxygen flow. Plus, if you keep them in a bowl too long, they might go blind. And get this, you can't even give away goldfish as prizes. The law's got a whole subsection about it. So, if you're planning on bringing a goldfish along on your next trip to Rome, make sure you've got a fancy tank ready for them. Now, let's play a little game. Check out this picture. Can you guess where it was taken? (laughs) Good luck with that. That chair you see is called a monoblock chair, and it's pretty special. You see, most objects give away clues about when and where they're from, like the shape of electrical outlets or the labels on your shampoo bottle. But the monoblock? Nope, it's totally what they call context-free. Crazy, right? Look at this, these chairs have caused quite a stir. Now, some folks think they're the bee's knees, calling them one of the world's most perfectly designed chairs. Others, not so much. They say the homogenous nature of the chair is disturbing and the real evil of globalization. And get this, in Basel, Switzerland, they actually banned these chairs from public spaces from 2008 to 2017 to keep the city looking pretty. But they're back now. One more thing you can't do in Switzerland is flush your toilet after 10 p.m. Oh no, wait! (laughs) It's an urban myth. Someone posted it on the internet, and thus the funky rumor spread. But here's the deal. Taking baths at weird hours is kind of iffy. It's not okay to run a bath late at night because it's noisy and rude. But listen up, there's no way anyone can stop you from taking a shower between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. As long as you don't hog the bathroom for more than 20 minutes. So go ahead, get your scrub on whenever you please. And make sure to flush the toilet, preferably with the lid closed. You don't want to have a germ convention in your bathroom. Uh Uh-oh, looks like you don't want to run out of gas while cruising on the Autobahn in Germany. The authorities have put a ban on stopping your vehicle on the highway. So make sure you fill up that tank before hitting the road. And don't even think about taking a stroll on the Autobahn, because you could end up with a fine for putting other drivers at risk, not to mention getting run over. Hey, did you hear about the musician that was run over on the Autobahn? He (laughs) B-flat. Anyway, stay safe out there. In Greece, wearing high heels at historical sites has been a no-no since 2009. Apparently, those pointy shoes can cause some damage to the ground and the architecture. So, if you're planning a trip to the Acropolis, you should leave those stilettos at home. But there's more. Did you know that high heels are also banned from Disney parks? Yeah, it's true. As much as we love our fancy footwear, it turns out that they can be a hazard in crowded places. So if you're planning a trip to the happiest place on Earth, make sure you wear some comfy flats instead. Your feet and Mickey Mouse will thank you. In Canada, you're not allowed to use more than 25 pennies per transaction. Yep, it's true. This is all part of a plan to phase out the penny, which started back in 2013. So, if you're planning on paying for something with a bunch of pennies, you might want to think twice. Like in a penny for your thoughts. But hey, at least you won't have to lug around all that extra change anymore. Now, sharing memes in Australia is technically illegal. Yeah, the Copyright Act says it's a no-no to distribute anything that might hurt the owner's copyright. But let's be real, Aussies love their memes too much to let a little thing like the law stop them. 
So don't worry, they're still spreading those hilarious pictures around. Traveling to Guatemala with your kiddos? Well, just make sure they don't try to sneak any party whistles onto the plane. Yep, you heard that right. Whistles are a no-no in this country. Apparently, too many people were using them to pretend they were police officers. So to avoid any confusion, the Guatemalan authorities cracked down and banned them. But don't worry, they didn't ban fake uniforms. Go figure. (laughs) Just kidding. If you were ever thinking of bringing a wheelbarrow into Nigeria, I've got some news for you. Don't even try. Sure, you can totally grab one once you're there, but they won't let you bring it across the border. Why? Well, they're all about supporting their own manufacturing industry, so they want to give their local wheelbarrow makers a chance to shine. Who knew wheelbarrows could cause such a fuss? Now, if Tunisia is your next vacay destination, listen up! Before you toss in a pencil for your Sudoku or crosswords, let me tell you something cray-cray. Pencils are a no-go in Tunisia. Yep, you heard that right. But relax, it concerns cases of import only. It's a mystery why they're banned, but better safe than sorry, right? So pack your bags wisely and leave those pencils at home. Who knows? Maybe you'll discover a new way to keep your brain sharp on the plane ride over. Hey, guess what? China has banned time travel movies and shows since 2011. Apparently, the authorities think they're too accurate and could mess with people's perception of history. So if you're heading to China, you don't have to worry about getting caught with a DeLorean in your luggage. But maybe leave your Back to the Future DVD at home if you plan on watching it on the plane. Trust us, you don't want to mess with Chinese time travel laws. Hey, did you know that on the beautiful island of Capri in Italy, flip-flops are a big no-no? Apparently, the locals love their peace and quiet so much that they've made it illegal to wear, quote, excessively noisy footwear, end quote. But don't worry, you can still rock your favorite pair of clunky shoes in the rest of Italy. Just make sure to leave the flip-flops at home if you're planning a trip to Capri. And if you do decide to break the rules, be prepared to face the consequences. Tourists have actually been prosecuted for disrespecting this law. So let's all be respectful of the locals and keep our footwear quiet, shall we? Have you heard about those Kinder Surprise candy eggs? Well, in the USA, they're banned. Can you believe it? Apparently, the little toy inside is a major choking hazard. And get this. Some folks have even been caught trying to smuggle them in from our neighbors up north in Canada. Talk about a candy caper. A black cat crossing the road, bananas on board a ship, a horseshoe hanging over the door, and other superstitions seem meaningless. But many people still believe in them. All these things make sense if you find out their origin. Let's look at 11 most famous superstitions. A football match, a business project presentation, or a tricky exam is coming. You're afraid of failing and therefore, knock on wood. People in Europe and the US have been preserving this ritual for over 2,000 years to avoid trouble. Knocking on wood to prevent disappointment could originate among peasants who knocked on tree trunks to scare away evil spirits who wanted to spoil people's lives. Some people are afraid to walk under a leaning ladder. And if you ask them what the reason for such fear is, they probably won't be able to answer you. The superstition that passing under a ladder can lead to failure appeared about 5,000 years ago in ancient Egypt. The pyramids were triangular because the Egyptians considered this form sacred. A leaning ladder also has a triangle shape, so walking under it felt like a desecration of a sacred symbol. In other cultures, such a ladder meant evil, misfortune, and betrayal. And in the 17th century, in England, guards forced prisoners to pass under ladders. One of the most famous bad signs is a broken mirror. To see yourself in its shards means failure for the next seven years. Even visually, the reflection in broken glass seems ominous. So many people are afraid to look there. But historically, this fear originated in ancient Greece, where many people came to special mystics who knew how to predict the future using a mirror image. If someone's reflection was distorted, then trouble awaited this person. A broken or cracked mirror also distorted the image, so people were afraid to look there. Then, in the first century CE, the Romans added the detail about seven years of misfortune to the superstition, 
The inhabitants of the Empire believe that human health changed every seven years, so looking at a distorted reflection meant precisely this period, and the Romans also believed that mirrors reflected particles of our souls. So if you broke a mirror, it meant you were hurting your soul. Spilled salt? Throw a pinch of it over your shoulder right away if you don't want trouble. Why can salt bring trouble and, at the same time, help avoid it? The answer lies partly in the name. The words salt and salary are similar because both of these things are valuable. In the past, salt was an expensive product. Spilling it on the floor meant throwing money away. Over 3,000 years ago, the ancient Sumerians were the first to throw salt over their shoulders to cancel misfortune. Then, the tradition passed to the Egyptians, Assyrians, and Greeks. In Europe, it was believed that when you threw a pinch of salt over your left shoulder, you blinded an evil spirit who wanted to cause you trouble. Now, salt doesn't seem valuable, so only a few people believe in this superstition. Sailors in the past were in a dangerous position when they went out to sea. No wonder they began to believe in all sorts of superstitions. And one of the most popular ones was related to bananas. Keeping the yellow fruit on board was believed to cause serious problems at sea. This superstition appeared in the 18th century when merchant ships leaving the Caribbean and Spain began to disappear. People who found shipwrecks said that bananas had been floating among the wooden planks. Thus, these fruits became messengers of disaster. Storms, pirates, sea monsters, anything could happen to a ship if bananas were on board. Some anglers are sure that bananas can spoil fishing, and this superstition has a scientific basis. Bananas emit a special gas that may be unpleasant to fish. Perhaps marine life can sense bananas from afar and doesn't want to swim close to them. These days, many sailors believe in the negative energy coming from bananas, too. So don't be surprised if you won't be allowed on the boat with this fruit in your hand. Have you ever noticed a horseshoe hanging on the front door of some houses? Of course, many people hang it as a decoration and don't attach importance to its meaning. However, since ancient times, it has been considered an effective talisman for scaring away bad spirits. Also, the horseshoe was a symbol of good luck in many cultures. All these beliefs first appeared in ancient Greece, where iron was considered a material that protected from evil. Also, the Greeks made horseshoes in the crescent moon form because it symbolized fertility and good luck. Then, this belief passed to the Romans, and after that, to Europe. People feared witches, sorcerers, and other mythical creatures in the Middle Ages, so they hung horseshoes in every house. They were sure that witches were afraid of horses, so they would avoid any objects related to these animals. If you want to avoid problems, don't open your umbrella indoors. This is one of the few superstitions that have practical significance. For the first time, people started talking about it in Victorian England. At that time, umbrellas were tougher and more dangerous than now. Iron spokes could injure someone or break something. All these troubles could also provoke quarrels with the people you lived with, so no one opened umbrellas inside. A black cat running across the road is one of the most famous superstitions. Some believe this is an omen of good luck. Others believe that it promises misfortune. The two versions have two different sources. In ancient Egypt, cats were sacred animals, and people revered them. Therefore, it was lucky for an Egyptian to see a black cat crossing their path. In the Middle Ages, these animals frightened people because they believed the black cat was witch's companion and a talisman of dark forces. If a black cat crossed the road, it meant that evil was watching you. When the pilgrims settled in the New World, the superstition began to spread throughout America, and many people still believe in it. Another animal mentioned in many superstitions is the magpie. This bird is known for stealing jewelry items and coins, so people consider it a harbinger of failure. People say when they see it, Good morning, Mr. Magpie. How's your lady wife today? Many believe these words banish failures from them. A magpie chooses one partner for life. So if you see a magpie without a mate, it means it's very lonely. Mentioning its partner may sadden the bird, and it won't play dirty tricks on you. The fear associated with the number 13 is so prevalent worldwide that it even got its own name, Triskaidekaphobia. In the modern world, people fear this number because of pop culture. 
Movies, books, and TV shows say this number is associated with evil, troubles, and dangers. Still, no statistics can prove that 13 is an unlucky number. There have been no accidents related to the number 13. People born on the 13th day feel great and have no health problems. But then, where did we get this fear from? The origins of Triskaidekaphobia refer us to Scandinavian mythology. There's one legend about Valhalla where 12 guests were invited to a great feast in Asgard. Odin, Thor, and other famous characters. But then Loki burst into the hall uninvited and became the 13th guest who ruined the party. So, 13 became a number that can ruin your life. Why is finding a four-leaf clover considered a harbinger of good luck? The probability of finding this plant is 1 in 10,000, and you must be lucky to find it. But beyond that, the four-leaf clover has an interesting legend about its origin. It says, Eve took a four-leaf clover to remember the Garden of Eden when she was expelled from paradise. Thus, the plant has become a symbol of prosperity, good luck, and happiness. Picture this. It's a cloudy, misty morning in the middle of winter. Tom wakes up, a bit nervous for the day ahead. He's leaving on a long journey through uncharted waters. His captain says they will try to leave England and make it all the way to the Americas. He's ready and packed to leave his house when his wife reminds him to take the biscuits he had spent the night preparing. Let's zoom in on these biscuits right here. They look a bit strange, don't they? These are called ship's biscuits, and they were literally the biscuits that sailors ate during long voyages at sea. A ship's biscuit could go years without going bad. I know that sounds impossible, but the secret is in the ingredients and baking methods. When sailors departed, they didn't know how long they would go without setting foot on land again. So they needed to be ready, food-wise. Otherwise, they could perish from extreme hunger. So bakers came up with this simple biscuit. It's mostly made out of three ingredients. Salt, flour, and a bit of water. The idea is that the dough stayed as stiff as it could. Then, bakers would put them in the oven for hours, at very low temperatures. The purpose of this slow baking was to take off all the moisture in the biscuits. Even if you're not an experienced sailor, you might suspect that moisture is the enemy of food preservation. It makes stuff get moldy and attracts insects and other animals. Plus, a ship is already an extremely moist environment. So the biscuits had to go on the countercurrent of all of that? A ship's biscuit can go six, seven, eight years without going bad. The little holes you see on them help to get the moisture out during the cooking process. A sailor like Tom, medium-sized, would get a portion of six to eight ship's biscuits per day. They were extremely nutritious and satiated a person's hunger. Now, this was a type of survival food. It wasn't meant to be super pleasurable, yummy, or even give you all the nutrients you needed. Just the basics. Now, do you have any idea what life was like in the 18th century? If you think about a city like New York, there were only about 18,000 people living there. For comparison, today the city hosts more than 8 million people. Back then, if someone had to travel from New York to Boston, there wouldn't be any of the convenience stores there were along the way. I mean, there weren't even roads as we know them now. So, people needed to make food provisions. And this is where portable soup came in handy. If you imagined a boiling pot of meat and veggies, I'm sorry to inform you, you are wrong. Portable soup is hard and condensed. It looks like this. Portable soup is a type of solidified broth, a very, very condensed substance made essentially of meat. Think about it. It's convenient. It's light. It doesn't take up much space. But it's extremely hard to make. The best meat to make portable soup is one with a lot of collagen, like beef shank. And the secret is slow cooking. You can't lose sight of it, though, because if it boils up, you ruin the whole thing. While cooking the meat, it will release its taste in the water in the pot, and after a few hours, it's safe to take the beef out. The remaining water will be rich in nutrients and fats. And once you reduce that down for about 18 to 24 hours, you'll get a gelatine-like nutritional substance. Once this cools down, it turns into a tablet of sorts. It's pretty amazing to witness the entire transformation process. But hey, this dark tablet is really satiable. And to eat it, you just needed to find some hot water and put the meat tablet inside of it. It would release all the condensed nutrients in it, giving you a warm, hearty meal. Here's a trick question for you. Do you know why hamburgers are called hamburgers if they are not made out of ham? 
Apparently, it has to do with the city they were first invented in, the city of Hamburg in Germany. But it wasn't what we are used to today. I mean, they didn't even use ketchup. Well, at least not the tomato ketchup we use now. But did you know that other types of ketchup have existed throughout history? As weird as it may sound, back in the 18th century, people ate mushroom ketchup. For your information, if you look up ketchup in some dictionaries, it is by definition a sauce made out of mushrooms. It has nothing to do with tomatoes. I wonder where people got that idea from. Anyways, to make it, you can use any type of mushrooms. Even shiitake if you're feeling fancy. The idea is to smash them, cook them, and add a bunch of spices to the mix. I'm talking clove, nutmeg, ginger, pepper, and whatever else your palate wishes for. And in case you're wondering what our ancestors ate it with, I have one word for you, meat. They would pour mushroom ketchup over a nice piece of steak, for example, like a gravy sauce or something like it. Now, if this just left your mouth full of water, I have good news. You can still find mushroom ketchup in Great Britain. It's just North America that kind of forgot it. Neat, huh? And what did people eat back in the day when they were feeling unwell? Today, we have a concept of food I particularly love comfort food, which is something to eat when you are feeling down and sad. But then, on the days you're feeling sick, what do you eat? I immediately think of a warm soup or something nutritious and light. Our forefathers drank something called posset. Now, posset could be described as an eggnog with some sweets added into it. Its recipe can be traced down to as early as the 15th century. The drink was considered such a reliable remedy that Shakespeare even used it as a poison in Macbeth. Here's another quick pop quiz for you. Why do we say the proof is in the pudding? This famous expression simply means that you'll only know the true value of something once you experience it for yourself. The expression started to be used back in the 1600s, but there's an important thing to note here. In Britain, pudding is not the sweet desert known by many in America. Rather, it's a savory dish, much like a pie. I guess it's safe to say that the British are good at turning almost anything into pie. From apple pie to pumpkin pie, chicken pot pie, and so on. Now, in the 18th century, they had something called beefsteak pie. This was an incredibly popular dish back then, but somewhere along the way, we lost the habit of making it. Sure, you can find steak and kidney pudding today, but it's got all sorts of stuff in it, such as potatoes, carrots, and thick gravy. Up until the 19th century, people ate the stripped-down version of this dish, which was basically made out of richly flavored meat. They say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. If you're in the U.S., you might eat some avocado on toast or a rich bowl of cereal. If you're in Vietnam, you might enjoy a warm bowl of broth soup or rice. But if you were eating breakfast in 18th century England, or even the United States, you would get something like this. This is the old school version of what we know as bacon and eggs. Except the doctor that back then, it was called collops and eggs. According to the traditional Hannah Glass recipe, straight from the most famous cookbooks of back then, the egg wasn't fried or boiled, it was poached, and the bacon was probably not as processed as we eat them today. A little toast was added on the side, and there you had it. The perfect start for a long day. According to the United Nations, India became the most populous country in the world in 2023. Can you guess where the United States of America stands in that rating? It's number three. And America is the fourth largest country in terms of size. It takes up some 6% of Earth's landmass. Plenty of space for 335 million people who live there, right? No need to squeeze them into one region. Well, not quite. The population of the U.S. is distributed pretty unevenly. Let's draw a line right through the middle of the country. It'll run from North Dakota in the north to Texas in the south. Once you input census data and do some math, astounding figures appear. 80% of the U.S. population lives east of the imaginary line. The remaining 20% live to the west. That's just one in five Americans. We're talking about large metropolitan areas, such as Los Angeles, San Diego, and San Francisco. 
You don't believe me? Just look at a satellite map of the US at night. The right part is shining pretty bright, right? But why? Why is there such a huge imbalance in population? Simply put, history and geography. The East Coast is the place where the US became independent in 1776. These are the original 13 colonies. Soon enough, settlers started spreading westward. One important milestone was the Louisiana Purchase. Today, this region is mostly what we call the Midwest. The area aligns nicely with the Mississippi watershed. Yep, this means plenty of fertile soil ideal for agriculture. But does this automatically mean a spike in population? The demographics of the U.S. reveal that a majority of its citizens live either on the east or the west coast. This leaves a large patch of land in the middle of the country virtually empty. People know it as America's underpopulated belt. The area stretches from the Canadian border in the north to Mexico in the south. The total surface area of this strip of land is 350,000 square miles. That's twice the size of California. One massive piece of land. In fact, this narrow strip accounts for 12% of the contiguous United States. That's the U.S. without Alaska and Hawaii. The belt runs north to south through seven states. But its population makes up only 1% of the total number of people living in the United States. Now, this doesn't mean that the area is completely empty. It's still home to just over 3 million people. That's roughly the population of the island country of Jamaica. But there is room here for many more residents. Let's take the example of Nigeria. Its total land area is slightly bigger than the sparsely inhabited belt in America. But Nigeria's population is a huge 206 million people. This makes it the seventh most populated country on the planet. Impressive, right? But why isn't the American Midwest living up to its potential? Well, time for one last history lesson. I've already mentioned how the United States expanded from the East Coast to the West Coast. This doesn't mean that the West was lagging too far behind. Take, for example, the cities of San Francisco and Los Angeles. They were incorporated in 1850. That's just 13 years after Chicago. The following year, Portland, Oregon became incorporated. You get the picture. And then, in 1869, the United States completed building its first transcontinental railroad. In terms of transport, the country was unified. There is no historical reason strong enough to explain why so few people live in the center of the country. So now it's time for some interesting geography. If you look at the physical map of the United States, you'll notice that this belt lies in the Great Plains. As the name suggests, the area is flat, which should be ideal for large settlements. Well, not really. East of this region, there is a huge patch of the color brown. It's covered by mountains. But not just any mountains. These are the Rockies. The range is around 76 million years old. It has several peaks over 14,000 feet. And most of the Rockies are national parks, a vast nature reserve. But most importantly, the range plays a vital role in the region's climate. Ever heard of the rain shadow effect? Let me explain. Wet weather systems form over the Pacific Ocean. Then they travel east, where they meet the Rockies. Now the air has to go up over the mountains. This is where it cools down and condenses. The final result? A lot of rain and snow for the people living on or west of the range. And just a few drops east of it. When air from the Pacific finally reaches the Great Plains, it doesn't contain much moisture anymore. In fact, the weather system starts taking up moisture from the surrounding landscape. This creates an arid climate east of the Rocky Mountains. That's the exact location of the belt where so few Americans live. It's one of the driest parts of the country. So when settlers came in the 19th century, they were like, nah, I'll just continue west. Plus, there was the gold rush in California they were heading for. The climate in this part of the plains isn't great for agriculture, and huge fluctuations in air temperature don't help either. In a single day, temperatures can drop from 70 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. These sudden changes in outside temperature are harmful to human health. It's like stepping inside an air-conditioned room on a sizzling summer day. Not a pleasant feeling. Southern California has a similarly dry climate. 
yet close to 40 million people live there. This makes California the most populous U.S. state. Their secret? A vast network of irrigation canals and aqueducts, plus a share of water from the Colorado River. Summers in the Great Plains get very hot, while winters are extremely cold. The reason behind these wild weather patterns are polar winds. They get a piggyback ride along the ridges of the Rockies and then rapidly descend into the plains. A winter day in Wyoming, for example, can start pleasantly warm, but later in the afternoon, the temperature can easily drop below zero. You just wouldn't know how to dress, and you probably wouldn't want to relocate here. That's what 99% of Americans think, too. Humans like to feel comfortable, so we choose to live in temperate climate zones. Places that are either too cold or too hot don't have a large population. Just look at the driest inhabited continent. You've guessed it correctly, it's Australia. Nearly 70% of the country is either arid or semi-arid. That's a subtle way of saying that it's a desert. That's why Australians are huddled in coastal areas. 90% of them live in big cities, such as Sydney, Melbourne, and Perth. The only exception is the capital, Canberra. They build it inland close to a water source. But Australia's interior is sparsely populated. Just like in the States. There is only one major town in an area the size of 12 Lake Michigans. A huge shout-out to the residents of Alice Springs. They truly live in an oasis. And what about places with a temperate climate, like Europe? The population is evenly distributed here, right? Well, yes and no, depending on the country. In Germany, 77% of people live in urban areas. They have plenty of major cities to choose from. Berlin, Hamburg, Munich, and Kuhn all have over a million residents. But let's look at neighboring France. How many cities with a population over a million can you name? Okay, Paris, definitely. It has over 12 million residents in the metropolitan area. But now comes the staggering fact. The next two cities on the list have a population of barely 2 million, respectively. Can you notice the huge imbalance? This is the case in most large European countries. In Greece, for example, 35% of the population lives in the capital, Athens. So the largely underpopulated center of the United States is not a unique example. America is the land of opportunities, but chances of finding a better life are greater in large cities. The country's top 100 metropolitan areas account for at least three-quarters of the nation's GDP. And most of them are located on the east and the west coast. There are no cities with over a million residents in America's underpopulated. We've all dreamed of visiting the Arctic and witnessing the natural wonders of polar bears frolicking on ice floes or the aurora borealis dancing across the sky. Well, sorry to break it to you, but you won't find any tourists flocking to Antarctica anytime soon. Why, you may ask? Let's dive into it. First off, where is Antarctica? It's located in the Southern Hemisphere, specifically at the South Pole. The Southern Ocean surrounds it, and most of the continent is covered by ice, making it one of the most remote and frigid places on Earth. Now, have you ever met someone who's visited Antarctica? Probably not. It's one of the least visited places on the planet, and only a handful of lucky explorers have seen its interior, which is mostly made up of glaciers and ice fields. But trust me when I say the wildlife and scenery are out of this world. Why shouldn't you travel to Antarctica? Well, for starters, the environment is incredibly fragile and can be easily damaged. Plus, there are no native human populations on the continent. So your travels would essentially be like visiting an uninhabited island. And let's not forget that it's also one of the most expensive destinations to travel to. Despite all that, Antarctica is not exactly guarded like a fortress, but there is an international agreement called the Antarctic Treaty. This treaty was negotiated to prevent any unwanted activity on the continent and bans some forms of testing done there by member states. But the primary reason we can't just waltz into Antarctica is that it has a delicate ecosystem that needs protection. 
The treaty states that Antarctica should be used for peaceful purposes only and should be free from any human activity that could harm the environment. Scientists are still learning about the continent's unique ecosystem, and our activity and machines could disrupt the delicate balance that exists there. If you're still itching to go to Antarctica, getting permission isn't exactly a walk in the park. U.S. citizens, for example, need to complete a special form and send it to the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. And once you're there, you'll need to follow some strict guidelines to protect the environment, like not disturbing any wildlife or taking souvenirs like rocks, plants, or animals. Now, technically, can you live in Antarctica? While there are no laws banning people from living there permanently, it's a very inhospitable environment and unsuitable for human habitation. Temperatures can reach negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit and below, making it nearly impossible for anyone to survive without the proper equipment and experience. Plus, the nearest piece of land is over 1,000 miles away, making any inhabitants completely cut off from the rest of the world. Who knows? Maybe one day we'll get the chance to visit this unique and fascinating continent. But until then, let's admire it from afar. Let's now talk a bit about the discovery of Antarctica. Unlike other places that were already inhabited, Antarctica never had a native human population. Ancient Greek philosophers had an idea about the continent and called it Antarctos, meaning opposite the bear. The bears it refers to are not the polar ones though, but rather the great and little bear constellations, which are only observable in the northern hemisphere. As a result, the term signifies the opposite of the land of the bear. Whaling and sealing voyages in the late 1700s and early 1800s would venture further south when rounding Cape Horn at the tip of South America. It was known that going further south often meant stronger winds, but also the risk of hitting floating ice of all sizes and of winds and seas that could prove dangerous to the ship and crew. Captain James Cook was the first to cross the Antarctic Circle on January 17, 1773, in the Ross Sea region. He reached a point further north a year later, and though he didn't sight land, he came to within 50 miles and saw deposits of rock held in icebergs, indicating that a more southerly land existed. The first sighting of Antarctica is widely acknowledged to have taken place in January of 1820 during the voyage of two ships under the command of Captain Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen as part of a two-year exploratory expedition around the world to discover new lands. The captain's ships were the first to have crossed the Antarctic Circle since Cook. The first undisputed landing on Antarctica didn't happen until much later, on January 24, 1895, at Cape Adare during the whaling voyage of the ship Antarctic led by Henrik Bull. A small boat with six or possibly seven men on board rowed ashore during calm conditions. You might not believe it, but Antarctica is actually a desert. With all that ice, you'd think it'd be like a winter wonderland with snowball fights and hot cocoa all day long. When we think of deserts, we picture camels and cacti and people struggling to find water. But in Antarctica, it's a whole different story. The struggle isn't to find water, it's to find anything that's not covered in ice. And the average rainfall has been just over 0.4 inches in the past 30 years. That's like a few drops of rain compared to what we're used to. So technically, it's not the dunes or sizzling heat that makes a desert, well, a desert. It's the lack of precipitation. But don't worry, if you ever find yourself lost in Antarctica, you won't have to worry about getting thirsty. Just make sure you bring a jacket and some mittens because it's cold enough to make you into a popsicle. Not only is Antarctica one of the driest places on Earth, but it's also the coldest, the windiest, and the highest. <laughs> Talk about overachieving. The penguins and scientists down in Antarctica have at times found themselves in a bit of a pickle when it comes to time. You see, unlike the rest of us on this big blue planet, there is no Antarctica time zone. All the lines of longitude meet at a single point at the South Pole, making it a bit of a head-scratcher when trying to figure out what time it is. 
Now, you might be thinking, but how do the scientists and researchers keep track of time down there? Good question. They typically stick to the time zone of the country they departed from. However, with stations from all over the world on the Antarctic Peninsula, things can get a little wacky. Imagine trying to coordinate with your neighboring countries without accidentally waking them up in the middle of the night. You might think that not much could survive in a place where the temperature is extremely cold, the sun barely shows up, and the wind could blow you away faster than a tumbleweed. Well, as in many places on Earth, life found a way in Antarctica too. Believe it or not, this frozen continent is buzzing with activity. It's home to billions of krill, which in turn attract lots of seals and more penguins than you can shake a fish at. But don't let their cute and cuddly appearance fool you. Penguins are the ultimate swimmers, with streamlined bodies that would make Olympic medal winners jealous. They come ashore to breed and chill, but their real talent is stealing pebbles from each other and forming mathematically precise huddles to stay warm. Antarctica is also home to the largest species of penguin on Earth. It's called the emperor penguin. Sure, these creatures are flightless birds, but that doesn't mean they can't jump. In fact, some of them can leap up to 120 inches. And let's not forget about the seals. With their furry bodies and special songs, these marine mammals are protected by the Antarctic Treaty, and they're thriving in the cool waters of the Southern Ocean, too. But the real stars of the show are the whales. During the Antarctic summer, these huge creatures show up in droves to chow down on the abundant krill. Have you ever noticed how phone numbers in movies usually start with 555, followed by four digits? Well, decades ago, phone numbers were formed by using numbers corresponding to the first two letters of the geographical area, known as the exchange name. Let's say you wanted to call Pennsylvania 94000. You would first dial 73 and then the 94000. The 7 corresponded to the PQRS on the keypad, and 3 was used for the letters D, E, F. It was difficult to find an exchange name that matched the 55 number. It corresponds to the JKL, and one of the few words you can make with any of those letters placed next to each other is Klondike. This number combination wasn't used often, and Klondike 5 was an old phone number given to company advertisements until it made its way to movies. Eventually, area codes appeared, and exchange names stopped being used. But 555 is still used in Hollywood today. The North American Numbering Plan Administration was given the task of handing out phone numbers. The numbers from 555-0100 through 555-0199 are reserved for Hollywood. This helped to ensure that movie fans wouldn't bother anyone if they tried calling the numbers they saw on the screen. Now, our phones have gone from being bricks to paper-thin gadgets, yet SIM cards don't seem to have evolved much in the past few decades. A SIM's job is to make sure the person using the cell phone is a legit subscriber. They're the only individual who's connected to a cell phone tower through that number. SIMs store two pieces of data – the International Mobile Subscriber Identity and the Authentication Key. They essentially help to carry out secret communications between your phone and your network. When the network recognizes and verifies your phone, everything works fine. This information can actually be programmed into devices nowadays, and some companies have added eSIMs to their newer phones. An electronic SIM card can be reprogrammed with your number, but it can't be removed from your cell phone. If you want to change to a different brand of phone, you usually just take your SIM card out and put it in your new phone. But with the eSIM, switching from one make of phone to another can be really inconvenient. You'll have to carry another phone while traveling abroad to avoid roaming charges on your cell. For this system to become widespread, both manufacturers and phone carriers will need to find a new standard, and that might take some time. You might also notice that your phone isn't as snappy as it used to be. Every time an update comes along, some apps get bigger and their features multiply. To make operating systems more attractive, the updates come with redesigns, and these features slow older phones down. 
Some people recommend waiting a week or so after an update comes out before installing it, instead of doing so straight away. 20% of updates have an initial period of instability, kinda like me. So you can just let others test the waters for you. If there's a problem, you'll probably hear about it. You might also notice very frequent update requests. That's because as your gadget ages, the software needs to update to keep things running smoothly. But one of the most important reasons why phones need to update all the time has to do with security. Sometimes you accidentally download a document that seems suspicious. That's because your hardware has encountered something that's been running on outdated software. To prevent this from happening, companies try to protect your phone with new updates. But it's not just for security purposes. Software updates fix bugs from previous versions. They also bring in new features to make your device compatible with new programs and gear. Security features such as Face ID and Touch ID are important for your phone. When you try to unlock it, whether you're looking at your camera or using your fingerprint, your phone compares the data it gets to what you've saved there. According to Apple, there's a 1 in 50,000 chance of someone falsely unlocking your phone with their fingerprint, and a 1 in a million chance of someone unlocking your phone with their face. And there's a 1 in 5 chance of me someday butt-dialing you. Sorry! Some researchers keep testing these security features to see how safe they are. At one point, they were able to make fake fingerprints to unlock phones, but it cost them a lot of money. When Face ID first came out, other researchers tried to compromise the face recognition technology during a convention. It took them less than two minutes. They took a phone from someone who was asleep, along with a pair of glasses. Then they stuck two pieces of tape where the eyes should have been. They turned the phone screen to face the individual, and it unlocked. I'm sure you've heard about phone batteries exploding. Here's why it happens. Engineers use lithium-ion batteries in phones because they're light and hold a lot of energy. Batteries have two electrodes on opposite sides. One electrode is called the cathode, and it holds the positively charged ions. The electrode that holds the negatively charged ions is the anode. When your phone is charging, the lithium ions move from the cathode to the anode. But when you're using your phone, they travel in the opposite direction. When the ions are moving, the anode and the cathode should never touch. So there's a plastic sheet that prevents the two electrodes from coming into contact. When the plastic separator fails, uh uh-oh, the anode and the cathode can touch. And that's when the battery overheats, catches fire, or boom. This can happen when a battery is not very well designed. Leaving your phone close to a heat source can also cause the battery to blow up. Even dropping your phone can cause damage to the separator and allow those two electrodes to touch. But phone batteries don't explode very often. Removable batteries were popular in the 1990s and 2000s, but they seem to have vanished now. In old phones, those chunky little fellas are often rectangular or square-shaped to make it easier to connect and remove them. Nowadays, there are some more unusual shapes for them out there, such as the L-shaped battery. Non-removable batteries give phones an elegant appearance. Companies have replaced the cheap plastic backs with metal and glass. Seal batteries also have made phones slimmer and sturdier. This is also how water-resistant phones became possible. A device with fewer openings prevents water and other particles from getting inside. Removable batteries took up more space inside phones because they needed an extra layer of protection to shield them from everyday impacts. When all that space became available, designers and engineers were able to add other features. Wireless charging, speakers, and fingerprint sensors all now fit comfortably in your phone. Alongside irregularly shaped batteries, screens with notches have appeared. These are the little dark non-screen areas right where your front-facing camera and microphone are located. Designers wanted to increase the surface area on device displays without getting rid of any features. So alongside the notch, they placed icons showing battery info, phone signal strength, the time, and other things on the side of the screen. This allowed companies to create taller screens and get rid of borders. This trick is great for marketing, too, since it's easier to sell a phone with more screen space. Hey, call me, maybe!
When you think of theme parks, you normally imagine laughter and fun times. But once they're closed and abandoned, well, that's a whole different story. Let's take a look at some of them. You decide to take a trip to New Orleans to visit Six Flags. When you arrive there, you discover the theme park is deserted. The sign that says closed for storm is still standing. You're feeling adventurous, so you let yourself pass the crackling gates. Is it chilly in here, or is it just me? Hmm. You walk past a swimming pool, and it looks like there's someone in there. You get closer, and oh no, it's an alligator! Better run and leave that thing alone. You keep exploring the site. The park took inspiration from the city's French architecture, but today the buildings are dirty, the windows are all shattered, and there are unusual items everywhere. Say, what is this vintage rollerblade doing here? The park closed during the hurricane, and it was left standing under 7 feet of water. No wonder the metal rides are all rusty now. This carousel doesn't look too inviting to me. We'll have to come back mm, another time. Hey, at least you got some cool-looking pictures, right? Let's make this next one even more exciting. Imagine you plan to visit Data Park at night. Somewhere in the countryside of Belgium, you'll find a creepy theme park derelict from many years ago. You have nothing with you but the floodlight on your phone. You see the entrance of a bridge and start to make your way across. The bridge sways and creaks. Just FYI, you are crossing one of the longest hanging bridges in Europe. You made it through. Whew. The surrounding woods are terrifying, and several deserted attractions start popping up along the way. The forest has taken this twirling swing set. This huge slide would probably break if you tried to use it now. The park is in terrible condition. No wonder they closed it down due to security reasons. Best to leave it now and come back in the daylight. Your next stop is Wonderland Eurasia, also known as Anka Park in Turkey. The theme park opened in March 2019, but closed shortly after. Once inside the gigantic complex, you stumble upon what looks like an empty warehouse, but ends up being an indoor roller coaster. Everything was left intact and is as good as new. You even take a quick sit on one of the roller coaster carts, perfectly lined up for the next ride. If you're feeling really adventurous, you can walk on the rails of the indoor coaster. Just be careful not to fall down. Oh, over there are the Flintstones. It's almost like a childhood deja vu here in the youngsters section of the park. On the horizon, you see what looks like the Jurassic World and decide to check it out. There are neglected statues of huge T-Rexes and fake skeletons of dinosaurs lying across the floor. Unlike the other derelict parks, everything here is new, which makes it all the more strange. Nara Dreamland was meant to be Japan's Disney World, but the project failed over time. Today, it's inhabited by moist ivies and strange birds. To get in, you'll pass a drawbridge and head into a pastel-colored castle. Your heart might be faster than usual when you pass a fog-covered roller coaster. Was that meant to be the Matterhorn? Yup. Everything about this place says you shouldn't be there. Tossed on the park's floor, you'll see reels of tickets and misconfigured stuffed animals. How about walking into an empty diner? It's bizarre how the tables and stools are still in place. Strolling through what was once a gift shop, you'll see empty shelves and an old-school cash machine. I'd say you better leave before anything comes out of here. Now, if I say Joyland, what do you imagine? The name says it all, right? But if you decide to visit Joyland today, I bet you'll have a very chilling time. Down in Wichita, Kansas, you'll find a once famous but now empty theme park filled with eerie sights. A pale blue slide in the middle of a forest? Check. Empty warehouses straight out of a horror movie? Check. A wacky shaft that looks truly wacky? <laughs> you bet. But if you visit it on a good sunny day, I'd say the park is weird, but still has some beauty. Joyland was built in the late 1940s. It carries a vintage aura that goes well with the neglected atmosphere. Hey, look at this rusty yellow Ferris wheel with a strip ticket box in front. I dare say it's almost charming. 
The Magic Harbor Amusement Park is not that magical after all. Just outside of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, you'll find an old theme park left to nature. Here, bumper cars are not bumping anymore. If you get into a hedge maze, you'll probably never find your way out of it. I'm not sure what you'll see running around amongst the rusty rides, so good luck if you're planning a visit. If you're looking for somewhere to cool down on a hot and sunny afternoon, how about Disney's River Country? Just kidding. You're definitely not going to want to get in the water there. The park was built in the 1970s and closed in 2001. Pay a visit to the Whitewater Rapids on foot instead of floating down the fake river. You'll have about 330 feet to stroll along a very bumpy pathway. Maybe you'll see hanging tires that served as swing sets out in the bay. You can even try zip lining if you trust the cable. To add a little more creepy to this story, the park was closed down due to a dangerous bacteria that thrived in warm bodies of water. Are you sure you don't fancy a swim? When you think Italy, I bet you think pasta and pizza and a leaning tower somewhere. Well, in the south of Italy sits the empty Miragica Amusement Park. The entrance still says welcome, but people stopped coming a few years ago. The site is covered in grass everywhere. The toy-like architecture is still there. Beneath the forgotten rails of an open-air roller coaster, you can almost hear the screams of excitement of people on the ride. This part of the park is usually prohibited, but there's no one around to control that now. It might be scary to be here, but adrenaline sure is running high. This next theme park is vacant only during a certain time of the year, but it still gives the true heebie-jeebie vibes. You have to catch a train from the city and travel to the end of the line till you reach the park. Coney Island is a seasonal park, open only from the middle of spring to the middle of fall. If you want to catch its unnerving vibe, you have to visit in winter. Then, you'd walk through the rows of empty stalls with the fairy string lights still hanging above your head. It looks frozen in time as all the rides lay shut down. Speaking of which, sometimes it gets frozen for real. Under many inches of snow, Coney Island is a little less disturbing. Then again, snow does have that effect on landscapes. But the park is empty and deserted nonetheless. I bet it's a great photo op. Now. Be sure to tell me in the comments which abandoned amusement park you found the creepiest. Hey, you know me. I won't be checking any of these out. I'll let you go first. The Himalayas have some of the highest peaks in the world, including Mount Everest. But it's no surprise airplanes find it difficult to navigate the area. But why are commercial airplanes actually banned from flying there? For starters, these mountains have an average height of more than 20,000 feet. Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the entire world, stands at 29,037 feet high above sea level. The area is rough, filled with snow, and has almost no flat surfaces. In case of sudden cabin depressurization, it would be really difficult to perform an emergency landing since there's literally no flat area there. More so, the low oxygen environment at such an altitude means there's likely to be a lot of turbulence. Not only is it really unpleasant for passengers, but random air movements and high wind velocity means that it's really difficult to maneuver the airplane. This area is also quite low populated, so there's not much there in terms of radar systems. And radar is crucial for aviation safety. Without radars, pilots would be unable to communicate with the ground to figure out flight conditions. It can also get so cold up there that jet fuel might completely freeze. Sure, the fuels used in airplanes usually freeze at around negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but it may be possible above Everest. The lowest temperature was recorded there back in December 2004, when thermometers showed a staggering minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit. So, no wonder pilots don't want to ever take that risk, especially on a commercial flight. Among the few airports located in the Himalayas, there's one considered to be the most challenging to land in the world. Only eight pilots on the planet are certified to do it. It's called Paro International Airport, and it's located in Bhutan, a landlocked country in the eastern Himalayas. 
First, landing there is so dangerous because you're literally flying through some of the world's tallest mountain peaks. Not to mention that those eight pilots also have to consider strong winds. Despite the challenges, they do manage to safely land over 30,000 people each year. Moving further, there's no radar there to guide the pilots, so they need to maneuver the aircraft entirely in manual mode. The pilots need to track their movements based on specific visual landmark checkpoints as they approach the runway. Moreover, flights are only allowed there during daylight hours and under good visibility. These pilots also need to watch out for utility poles and roofs on the hillsides too. It means they often squeeze their planes between mountain peaks at 45 degree angles before dropping quickly onto the runway. No wonder only two airlines fly to Paro International Airport. Apart from these commercial pilots, there are specially trained helicopter rescue pilots who spend most of their career at 20,000 feet in the sky. Most of the time, they partner with equally experienced climbers who train by crossing the Kumbu Icefall. It's dubbed the most dangerous square mile on the planet. Made up of ice pillars as tall as a six-story building, this huge stretch of the glacier on Everest's western side is filled with bottomless ice holes. It takes between 4 to 12 hours to get from one edge of the icefall to the other, depending on the experience of the climber. You may think it's a pretty serene location since you're literally only surrounded by ice and snow, but these local professionals claim otherwise. One Everest veteran said that the noise was actually the worst part of the job. The mountain produces awful squeaking sounds and sometimes even sighs. It often makes people feel like it's talking to them, warning them about the treacherous environment. Mount Everest isn't the only no-fly zone in the world. Surprisingly, Disney parks are also part of this exclusive club. So you won't ever be able to look out of your plane window and see the beauty of fairy tale castles from up above. In recent years, a lot of crowded tourist attractions, including Disney parks, have increased their security measures to make sure their visitors are as safe as possible. As such, no aircraft is allowed to fly within 3,000 feet of Disneyland in California or Walt Disney World in Florida. It was initially a temporary ban, but this rule became permanent back in 2003. Some other places don't have planes flying over them because of their historical importance, like Machu Picchu, located in the Peruvian Andes Mountains. There's also a large number of rare wildlife species and plants that grow exclusively in this area. It's crucial that they're protected as well as possible. What does it have to do with planes not flying over that area? Firstly, it reduces the volume of harmful chemicals in the area. Secondly, if a plane ever needed to perform an emergency landing in this location, it'd cause irreversible damage to buildings and wildlife. Surprisingly, planes can fly over the Greek Parthenon in Athens, but with one condition, not to get closer than 5,000 feet above it. This way, the historical building is kept a bit more protected from any emergency landings, since there are specially designated areas around it. You won't be able to see the Taj Mahal from above either, since it's one of the most important, oldest, and most beautiful pieces of architecture in the world. It also needs added security features. This building dates back to the 1600s. UNESCO announced it a World Heritage Site in 1983. The Indian authorities set up a no-fly zone above it in 2006. They did it to safeguard not only the building itself, but also the crowds of tourists that come there each year. 7 to 8 million people. Buckingham Palace is well known for being the residence of British monarchs. So, for the Queen's security, a no-fly zone was set up here too. Planes aren't allowed to fly over Windsor Castle either to make sure the royal family is equally protected. Other important British buildings with no-fly zones include Number 10 Downing Street, the British Prime Minister's official residence and office, and the Houses of Parliament. George Washington's home in Mount Vernon, Virginia, can only have planes flying above it at more than 1,500 feet. The historical wooden mansion was built for President George Washington between 1758 and 1778. Unfortunately, the building has seen a lot of damage over the years. So, in an effort to preserve it better, authorities decided to prohibit vibrations produced by flying aircraft. That's why another no-fly zone was established there. It covers the airspace above this National Historic Landmark, 
That's probably the reason why you'll rarely see pictures of this house from above. Since it's the resident of the US president, it's not allowed to fly over Washington, DC. It's also the home of Congress and other establishments. So the authorities set a special flight rules area, stretching for 30 miles around Ronald Reagan International Airport. This means that it's one of the airports with the most precise takeoffs and landings. Pilots have to carefully tackle no-fly zones, which sometimes results in uncomfortable takeoffs for passengers. Whenever a pilot breaks a no-fly zone, it's a big problem, like the one that happened back in 2005 when a pilot accidentally steered the plane into a prohibited zone. The capital had to be evacuated immediately, and their regular activities were interrupted. Other capitals of the world have similar requirements, like Budapest, for example. In the capital city of Hungary, planes aren't allowed to fly over the ancient inner city of Pest and the Buda Hills. Almost all air traffic is generally prohibited above Paris, too, with some exceptions. Aircrafts flying no lower than 6,500 feet. Flying helicopters are also a big no-no within the city limits. Only certain choppers undertaking precise missions can get special authorization. Generally, passenger planes aren't allowed near the island of Manhattan either, partly because of the really tall buildings there and the added risk of collision, but mostly because all three major New York airports, John F. Kennedy International Airport, Newark Liberty International Airport, and LaGuardia Airport are very close to each other, so the air traffic in the area has to be really well thought out to make sure the planes don't cross paths. So how do you feel about public restrooms? Dread? <laughs> Thought so. But have you ever wondered why toilet stall doors rarely reach all the way to the floor? Well, it turns out there's not one, but several fully valid reasons for not enclosing bathroom stalls. Some of them are obvious, while others turned out to be unexpected. Ready to take the plunge? Here we go! If a person loses consciousness or has some other urgent medical condition in a fully enclosed stall, it could take hours until someone notices it. And as you know, there are emergencies when every minute counts. On the other hand, if there's a gap between the floor and the door of a bathroom stall, other visitors will immediately notice a person who's passed out. On top of that, in this case, there's no need to break down the door, since a medical worker can slip under it through the gap and unlock it from the inside. Space below the stall door helps visitors to see that there's someone inside and prevents people from barging in on another person. You know how it works. You see someone's feet inside the stall, you look for another unoccupied toilet, or you wait your turn. Besides, when public bathroom doors don't reach the floor, it prevents unnecessary lines. People can calculate in their heads how much time they'll need to spend on waiting for an unoccupied stall and decide whether they're ready to wait or they'd rather look for another public restroom. Now, fully enclosed stalls are more likely to provide you with an unforgettable gag-inducing experience since it isn't so easy to get rid of the smells inside. Open stalls, on the contrary, have much better ventilation, which is essential when it comes to public bathroom stalls. Thanks to air circulation, bad smells dissipate faster, but still not fast enough for me. A bit more obvious, and probably one of the most common reasons, is that not fully enclosed bathroom stalls are cheaper. First, to produce a door in such a stall, less material is needed. Therefore, it costs less to make, to buy, and to install this door, which is one of the most crucial things for a business owner. In addition, simple stall divisions are way easier. They don't depend on the height of the ceiling or the evenness of the floor. But if you decide to order floor-to-ceiling stalls, it will require much more effort, such as custom fitting and precise cutting. For many businesses, all this trouble doesn't make any financial sense. Leaving a gap under a bathroom stall door discourages all kinds of inappropriate behavior. Psychologically, the less protected and enclosed a person feels, the less likely they are to do something harmful and risky. And if a public toilet stall reaches all the way to the floor, it allows people to feel like they're in private. As a result, they won't hesitate to, let's say, draw graffiti or damage the stall in any other way. Also, with a gap under the door, other visitors will notice somebody who's causing trouble and stop this activity right away. It's next to impossible to get out of a fully enclosed bathroom stall on your own 
once the lock jams. You'd be trapped inside and must call for help. On the contrary, when a toilet has a gap under the door in case of an emergency, you can easily escape by crawling under it. Imagine the nightmarish situation when, after doing your business, you suddenly realize there's no toilet paper in your stall. Ew. Unfortunately, if at that moment you're in a fully enclosed stall, no one can save you. But if you've been lucky enough to experience this tragic problem in a stall with a gap under the door, you can swallow your embarrassment and ask your neighbor to save the day by handing over some paper. Have you ever had any embarrassing moments like this in a public restroom? Let me know down in the comments! Fully enclosed stalls give visitors a cozy feeling of isolation. They cut out the noise of heavy bathroom traffic, and as a result, people lose the sense of others who are waiting for their turn. They get more relaxed and spend longer on taking care of their business. But when a bathroom stall isn't entirely enclosed, visitors tend to feel more rushed, which speeds up the traffic and gets rid of bathroom lines. And the last, and probably the most apparent reason for leaving the gap, is that it makes bathrooms easier to clean. A custodian can simply run their mop under the doors instead of wasting time on opening and closing each of them. You can imagine what a time saver it is if a bathroom is large. The same goes for power cleaning the floor. When there's more open space for water to flow, cleaning becomes faster and more efficient. Boy, file this stuff away for when you're at a party and you are surrounded by obnoxious people who won't let you get a word in edgewise. Simply jump in with some of these public restroom facts and watch how fast you can clear the room. Okay, okay, now I get it. Yes, I promise I will never complain about gaping holes under public bathroom stall doors ever again. But here's another question that intrigues me. Why do most bathroom main entry doors open inwards? I mean that when you enter, you must push the door, and when you leave, you pull it. But wouldn't it make more sense if it were vice versa? This way, you wouldn't have to touch the door handle with your freshly washed hands as you exit. Just push it with your shoulder and you're free. Even though it's not true about all public bathrooms, to exit most of them, you must touch the doorknob. What gives? Well, first, it prevents the door from blocking the hallway. Imagine there's high bathroom traffic. As a result, if the door was of the push-to-exit type, it would take even more space and make people who walk down the hallway crowd at the door. Also, next to many public toilets, there are closets, drinking fountains, and other utilities. And a door that opens outward would cause a lot of inconvenience to those who need to use these amenities. Plus, can you imagine how hard it would be to navigate the hallway if there's an emergency? Bathroom doors shouldn't hinder or block the movement in case of an evacuation. Another reason to have push-to-enter doors in public bathrooms is safety. First, these doors have both the lock and hinges on the inside. Therefore, no one can lock you in the bathroom. And secondly, if a bathroom had a push-to-exit door, by opening it a bit too fast, well, you could hurt Ouch. someone who's walking past the doorway at that moment. Also, doors that open inward help to handle unpleasant smells, which aren't rare for public bathrooms. The thing is that when you open the door in the bathroom, some fresh outside and non-smelly air gets sucked inside and helps to dissipate the bad smells. As for a door's opening outward, the pattern would be the opposite. The smelly air would be constantly sucked out of the bathroom. You probably won't argue that when you're in the bathroom, you want some privacy. But at the same time, a door that swings out from the restroom gives visitors and passers-by a much better unrestricted view of what's happening inside the bathroom than one that opens inward. A push-to-enter door also makes sense if you're going to the bathroom to wash something off your hands. This way, you can use your shoulder to open the bathroom door, and you don't have to touch the door handle. And finally, according to my personal observations, people are usually in a way bigger hurry when they enter the bathroom than when they exit. You never know, maybe those precious seconds saved by a push-to-enter door will prevent some poor soul from having severely extremely unpleasant moments if you know what I mean. And I'm sure you do. Well, flush that. Hey, if you learned something new today, then give the video a like and share it with a friend. And here are some other videos I think you'll enjoy. Just click on the left or right. 
And remember, stay on the bright side of life. I know, right? Why couldn't we just strap a huge parachute to the entire plane? You bring up a great point. With some airplanes malfunctioning, why don't we just make them float safely to the ground? I mean, if we can drop a human being on a parachute, why can't we do the same for planes? Well, my friend, the answer is simple. Wait. Parachutes with the power to help float a jumbo jet would be extremely heavy, and that extra weight would cut into the number of seats for travelers. And let's not forget that most commercial airplane malfunctions happen during takeoff or landing, when a parachute couldn't be of much help anyway. Can you imagine how many parachutes the size of a football field we would need to safely land an Airbus A380? That thing supports about 850 people and is about 400 times heavier than a small personal aircraft. Plus, adding more weight to the plane would mean fewer people on board each flight. That translates to more flights. Just because there would be fewer seats on board, it doesn't mean people don't have to travel places, right? Well, that would mean more takeoffs and landings. And that makes the possibility of even more crashes way bigger. Now, the idea isn't all bad. There are whole plane parachutes available for lightweight aircrafts. The chute is located in the main body of the aircraft and can be actioned when the pilot triggers a handle somewhere in the ceiling. A big manufacturer of these devices is based in Miami. The founder thought of such a project after a glider he was in began spinning uncontrollably and he ended up plunging into a lake. He eventually made it after this unfortunate event, but he shifted his ambitions to ways he could make flying in an airplane safer. But what about parachutes for each passenger on board? Could we add those on board each flight to heighten the safety standards? Well, that would be extremely tricky in case of an emergency. Most of these events involve tens if not hundreds of people. Panic would quickly set among people on board. Nobody would be able to use their parachutes, not to mention the landing itself. Even trained jumpers find it difficult at times. Most people boarding planes day to day don't have such experience. So the best way is to shed weight. One solution would be to get rid of the bulkiest parts of an aircraft, like the wings or engines, once the parachutes are triggered. That way, only the main body of the airplane would be rescued, which includes the passengers. That sounds like a much better idea than having hundreds of panicked passengers trying to figure out how to use a parachute. And in the end, there really aren't many instances where a passenger parachute would really save a life. For starters, it would need to be during the day. Otherwise, you have no idea what you're doing. It would definitely need to be over a piece of land. Parachute or not, landing on water is not really a good idea. So, let's just stick to our seat belts and hope for the best. How about pilots? Do they or should they have parachutes available during each flight? You see, flying a commercial plane is a whole different ball game than your average skydiving adventure. When you're up in the air, way up at thousands of feet, the temperature is so low and the air is so thin that jumping out of a plane would be a terrible idea. You'd freeze your toes off before you even had the chance to pull your parachute cord. And let's not forget about hypoxia, which is just a fancy way of saying that you can't breathe properly at high altitudes. That's why planes have oxygen masks for their passengers and crew. But skydivers at that height would need their own oxygen tanks, which is not exactly practical. Plus, have you ever tried to jump out of a plane mid-flight? It's not like there's a handy little door for you to hop out of. Commercial planes are not designed for skydiving, and attempting such a stunt would be downright dangerous. So, while it might seem like a good idea to have pilots carry parachutes just in case, it's just not practical for the type of flying they do. They're better off sticking to their day job and leaving the skydiving to the professionals who know what they're doing. Parachutes are not just for jumping out of planes, but are also used to reduce the speed of motion of objects in the atmosphere. In most cases, they are made out of strong cloth like silk or nylon and are designed to create drag and slow down an object's motion. But what makes a good parachute? Well, it's all in the fabric. A parachute's cloth should have high braking strength, tear resistance, elasticity, and air permeability. The warp and filling yarns are specially cut and sewn, each in a particular direction. This helps to prevent any tears from spreading further. Parachutes are made from various raw materials such as canvas, silk, dacron, kevlar, and nylon. Ripstop nylon is a popular choice due to its lightweight, strength-to-weight proportion, waterproof, and tear-resistant qualities. 
The manufacturing process of parachute fabric is quite intricate, with steps involving assembling, finishing, and rigging. During assembly, the ripstop nylon cloth is cut to pattern pieces by a computer-guided mechanism or manually using a round-bladed electric knife. The trapezoidal panels are sewn together to form a wedge-shaped device. Then, a number of these devices are sewn together side by side to form a circular canopy. Each panel and seam is carefully inspected for defects, pleats, or incorrect stitches per inch. With the right materials and careful construction, a parachute can safely land a person on the ground in case of an emergency. Next time you see a parachute, remember all the hard work and attention to detail that went into making it. Speaking of amazing parachutes, a little company from Devon just made history. They are the masterminds behind the special high-tech parachute fabric that helped NASA's latest rover, Perseverance, safely land on Mars. The challenge was not easy. They needed to create a lightweight fabric that could withstand extreme heat and carry a spacecraft safely to its destination. But after 15 years of hard work, they did it. The unique fabric was developed using a high-tenacity nylon yarn spun at high speed. And after being washed, colored, and processed with a special finish, it was ready for the big test. The material was then sewn into its parachute form in the US and tested in the world's largest wind tunnel. But the best part of the story was when the director of the company's woven fabric department saw the landing on Mars. He basically lost all cool when watching his product on TV, safely making it to the Red Giant. How did they manage to grab such an amazing gig, you might wonder? Well, the company was approached by NASA after exhibiting their work at industry events in the US. And gee, did they deliver? They created this bespoke fabric that allowed the Perseverance rover to make a soft landing on Mars. You know, should you ever find yourself on Mars and see a parachute lying around? Don't forget to thank these amazing people and their cool parachutes. Their piece of fabric will stay there until someone comes and tidies up the planet. Most people credit famous inventor Leonardo da Vinci with inventing the parachute. But this is, in fact, a myth. In 1968, some researchers were poking around some ancient Renaissance drawings and found some sketches that looked just like Leo's parachute design. But get this. They were actually from the studio of an Italian inventor who lived 70 years before Leonardo was even born. This Italian inventor was a real Renaissance man 